I'm going to talk to you about something that you now have seen, what we call our mission trailer, like a movie trailer. And, uh, and so I, I have this hypothesis, you guys can tell me whether I'm right or wrong, that people actually kind of like hearing something twice or hearing something they already know a little bit. It's confirmatory and easier to listen to. So you're going to hear me talk about some of the things that you saw in that video. And uh, that's the second edition of our mission trailer. Uh, the first one actually won a regional Emmy and it was done by, um, not in fact by NASA, but by a really lovely film company in Phoenix called True Story. So if you need a great video, go to True Story. So we humans have sent a couple of people, but mostly robots out to explore our solar system. And, and, and I would assert, I'm just gonna assert for the purposes of this talk that, that we can't help ourselves, that we are just fundamentally in our genes, we are explorers and we always need to know what is out ahead. And to me, this is one of the real reasons, maybe for me, the reason to do planetary exploration is because it lets us as a species do exploration a better way than we ever did on earth. It gives us a hopeful story about the kind of people we can be in the future uh, in a way that, for example, Europeans coming to inhabit North America didn't so much do that. And I think that going into space is a story of hope and a story of the future. And I think that's something we all need in the world right now. And so to me, that's what space exploration is for. It's to help us all have a vision of who we could be. So we sent people to the moon. And uh, this is what's called the limb of the moon. So if you look at the moon, it's a little bit off on the side. You actually can't see this from Earth. So this is one of the many, many proofs that we actually did go to the moon. This is Orientale Basin. And if you don't have a favorite giant impact basin on the moon, I recommend this one. It's particularly beautiful, don't you think? So that's one of the rocky bodies we've gone to see. We've gone to see the rocky body, Mars. No people there yet, but lots of lovely robots. And this cliff on Mars is named Burns Cliff. And I was lucky to take mineralogy from Roger Burns when I was an undergraduate, and that was very inspiring. So we've seen rocky bodies. We've seen bodies made of gas. We all know this is Jupiter and, uh, and icy ones. And uh, so the one kind of body that we have not yet visited in our solar system is in fact, bodies made mostly of metal on the surface, which is what we think that Psyche is. And so that is very exciting to me. Uh, I, I grew up reading um, the stories of the explorers to Antarctica. And, 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 to, and to the North Pole and across trackless wastes. And, and I, I, in some fantasy world, I thought I was gonna be one of those people, but you know, with the exception of some of the deep parts of the ocean, people have really been everywhere. But here's a place that humans haven't visited even with a robot proxy. So that's what's so cool about this mission. We're gonna to go to a whole new kind of body. But in case you didn't realize this, this is not a photograph. This is an artist's interpretation of what this asteroid might look like based on a year of Saturday afternoon Zooms with me. And so, and so do we know, do we actually know what does the asteroid Psyche actually look like? We really don't know. This is Psyche in the red circle from my backyard. It looks like a star and that's what asteroid means, right? It means star-like because the first people, in fact, if you would like the story of the discovery of the asteroids, it's pretty great. And I'll tell you in the question period if you're interested, but they named them asteroid because it means star-like. Even through Hubble, it's just a couple of pixels. We are gonna look at it through James Webb, I think in the first cycle of observing and then it's gonna be more than a pixel. But at the moment, this is the best that we have. So what people, what clever teams, four or five teams around the world of very clever people have done is they've looked at the light curve of Psyche. So they look at Psyche through a telescope and they record the light coming into the telescope as Psyche revolves on its axis. So they can see when it gets brighter and dimmer. They've also watched it in radar bounces. Does it not blow your mind to know that a big radar dish like Arecibo used to be, they did this with Arecibo, can send radar all the way out to the far edge of the asteroid belt and receive the return. Isn't that a technology, a miracle? <laughs> just, that blew my mind. I didn't know people could do that before this. So they combine the radar and the light curves and they get shape models. And so the, the moral of the story is shape, Psyche is shaped like a potato. Like that's all we know, that's it. That's it, we have no pictures, no spacecraft have gone near it and photographed it. We really don't know. And so think for a moment about the challenge of trying to design a mission to go to an unknown body and absolutely figure out something scientific about it when we don't know for sure what it's made of or what it looks like. How do you design the instruments for that? That's been a really, really interesting problem. 
So we don't know what psyche looks like. So no matter how many times I show you these beautiful artist interpretations, please remember they are not real. And you will be looking on in amazement just as we are at the same time. Because I will tell you that uh, the guy Jim Bell that you saw in that, in that video is the head of the Imager project. And we've already built a pipeline that will take the images from his cameras and put them on the internet free for the entire world to see within a half hour of our receiving them. We're not gonna edit them. We're just gonna send them out there so everybody can look at them just with us and go, what is that? And so, uh, so now you've seen the best pictures we have. So a good question that would be is how big is Psyche? And uh, before I show you Psyche in this picture, I'll just point out the little heart-shaped thing there is, is a little place, a house that my husband and I have. We spend a lot of time there in the woods in Massachusetts. And the other one is Ithaca, where I grew up, which is very similar to here. So even though I live in Arizona now, I feel so at home on this campus. It just reminds me of Ithaca. So uh, here's how big asteroid uh, Psyche is. It's, um, it's about the size of Ohio. It's you know kind of Switzerland sized. Uh, as asteroids go, that's very large. So you should go, whoa, look how big that is. Uh, <laughs> it's got about 1% of the mass of the asteroid belt. So it's a big one and it's dense. Um, that is, I always love making the map. So what do we think that it is? And you saw this in the video. So now I'm gonna kind of go over it again. Let's go back to the very beginning of our solar system. When what we had was a spinning disk of dust and gas around our young star. Maybe the star had just begun to do its nuclear processes. And we know that we went from a spinning disk of dust and gas to rocky planets that we can stand on. You know, we have a proof of existence. Here we are. And somehow we got from there to here. And we are pretty sure that the first step was that material got very quickly clumped together into little planets that we call planetesimals, little planet. Something, say, the size of Psyche or the size of a continent, maybe. And we have evidence of this from meteorites that fall to the Earth. Where do the meteorites come from? Almost all the meteorites we have come from the asteroid belt. So the remnants of the planetesimals, the fragments, the shrapnel, the leftovers of planet building are in the asteroid belt now. And we get little bits of them that fall off and fall to the Earth. The lighting is confusing, isn't it? Just keeping you on your toes. So here's the process that we think we went through. Gas and dust and little tiny pebbles, which I can talk a lot about tiny pebbles if you wanna know about them. They uh, become planetesimals through some uh, fascinating and not well-established physical processes. And I just wanna tell you one thing about it because uh, for those of you who are a little bit physics-y, you will really love this. Um, you can imagine little bits of dust can cling together by electromagnetic forces, just like the static electricity that makes dust bunnies under your bed, right? They can make dust cling together. We see it in our regular life. And you can imagine really big objects uh, like the size of the moon sticking to another one like that through gravity. But in between, there's a great big gulf where electromagnetic forces are not strong enough to make them stick together and gravity forces are not strong enough to make them stick together. So this has been a problem for a long, very long time. Now people have some great ideas based on some very cool physics about how big turbulent waves can crush stuff together. And if you're interested in this, I can give you a million, million citations, but it's kind of cool to know that it's actually really hard to make planetesimals, it's not easy. But we know they existed because of the meteorites that come from the asteroid belt, which is the leftover of the planetesimals. And some of them melted, see the red there? Some of them melted. They melted from the heat of a very short-lived radioisotope, aluminum-26, um, which I can also tell you fascinating stories that Yuri uh, comes into as well. The discovery and understanding of aluminum-26, which does not exist anymore, it's all burned out, but it created a lot of heat. And when, that, when those planetesimals heated up, the little bits of metal in them melted and sank to the middle and made metallic cores. And the rock was left on the outside. Same structure as our earth, right? Metal core, rocky outside. And uh, then they uh, solidified, that's called differentiation. When the metal goes to the middle and the rocks on the outside. It's a very interesting process for a habitable rocky planet like ours, because there are a lot of ideas about how the magnetic field can help protect our atmosphere and keep us habitable and the magnetic field comes from the core. So we really wanna know about cores. And like Jim said in that video, we can't get there. So very interested in the very first generation of cores to ever form the ones in planetesimals.
So planetesimals collide together, they stick together, they make things called planetary embryos. Like we actually think Mars is a kind of a planetary embryo. It's a little insulting because we mainly think of Mars as a practically a real planet, but it's kind of small. It was sort of stranded out there by Jupiter. People say it was starved, which is also sad. Uh, and so we think of it as just a little planetary embryo and, and, and big proper planets like the Earth and, and, and Venus. And so it turns out it took about 5 million years to make Mars and about 100 million years to make the Earth and the Moon. Now, are those large amounts of time? Not when compared to the age of the solar system. And so I used to tell my students, sometimes I still tell them, that if they don't remember this one number, they will fail. That's the pass-fail criterion, 4.568 billion years. That's the age of the first pebbles in our solar system. 4,568 millions of years. And so five millions of years is like this. And it turns out that if the solar system's age was really a 24 hour day, Mars was made in 94 seconds and the planetesimals were made within 30 seconds. So these are very fast processes that record the very beginning of the solar system. So that's why it's so cool to go look at asteroids because they're the, the eggs and the flower that made our solar system, that made our planets. All right, so these are the pictures that you saw um, in the video. So we think that, that it's like you start out like this with a metal interior and a rocky outside, it had differentiated. Now, how do you get that rocky, out, that rocky interior to show on the surface? Well, the simplest thing we could think of is that it was hit a bunch of times and got the rock knocked off it. And then it eventually solidified and made its own magnetic field. I also always remind people that magnetic fields are purple. So please draw your magnetic fields in purple in future in future. So why do we have these beautiful cartoons? Well, partly because the budget of a giant NASA mission allows you to do that, but also because the whole motivation for the mission and the reason that we chose the instruments that we chose and why we're doing what we're doing is because we had in our heads a little videotape of this process, all the things I just told you about dust to planetesimals, differentiation, knocking the rock outside, trying to see the, the, the remnant core. And we realized that the review panel that was going to judge our proposals didn't have that videotape in their heads. And so we made uh, 60 frames with our artist friend and we made them into flip books so that we could show people what we thought that Psyche was so they could understand it. So when I say that you can be an artist and work at NASA, I really mean it. It's very important. So here's uh, Psyche's orbit out in the outer main asteroid belt. It's often closer to Jupiter than it is to the Earth. Let me ask you, how many of you have seen some of the many embarrassing headlines that say Psyche is gonna make us all rich? Has anybody seen those? <laughs> Someone has seen them. Yeah, a couple people have seen them. So right away, you know that Psyche is never gonna make us all rich. It's way too far away. We are never, we have no capacity whatsoever to bring it to the Earth. And even if we did, then the metals market would crash to zero, wouldn't it? And then it would not make anyone rich. And so just important to refute those headlines by pointing out how far away it is. So we have five, oh, that's interesting. It's hidden under the, the Zoom headline. So I'm just read to you. We have five major science targets with this mission. And the first and most important one is to determine whether Psyche is in fact a core or if it's actually unmelted material or some other kind of material we don't know about. So here's the problem. There's about a million and a half asteroids, and about nine of them seem to be made of metal. So seeing a metal asteroid, you know right away, this is not coming from some common everyday regular process that happened to every asteroid. It's something unusual. And so I always ask people all over the world, ever since 2011, how do you think you could make an asteroid that has mostly metal on its surface? Which we're pretty sure is true, but we won't really know till we get there. And could you just in your head add that phrase, we're pretty sure it's true, but we know, won't know till we get there to everything I say. Because, because quite likely everything I tell you tonight will prove to be wrong, won't it? Because we really don't know. It's this fundamental discovery. And so our best guess is that it's the exposed core of a planetesimal, but it could be any one of a number of other things. And my dearest hope is that it's none of the things we thought of so far. Because if it's something quite unusual and we haven't even thought of it yet, then we'll learn a lot more. It'll be super exciting. So that's what I'm really hoping for. All right, how does a NASA mission happen? How many of you have been involved in a NASA mission in any way? Anybody, a few people? Yeah, yeah. So have you been on science teams and, and yep. Yeah, and so, so some of you know, and I think most of you don't, and I didn't know before I got into this, how this happens. And so uh, there are really big missions for NASA that are called flagship missions, like the Perseverance rover. 
um, Europa Clipper that's going to be going in a couple of years to the moon Europa. And uh, is everything okay over there? Oh, it doesn't matter. I don't think that anything else is going to be hidden by that. Um, uh, and those flagship missions are determined by NASA headquarters and directed by NASA headquarters. And then there are some smaller, smaller classes of missions uh, like Psyche that are competed. And so we competed through the discovery program and actually our total budget is, uh, is just over a billion dollars, but that's a small mission. <laughs> <laughs> um, and the competition process is unbelievably fierce and exciting. And I'm going to tell you a tiny bit about it. And I'm going to try not to really dive into anecdotes because I could talk about it forever. It was just a crazy life event. Um, so ours started um, like this, except for now we need to get the cursor back on, the, on this because my thing doesn't work. Sorry, it makes the, there we go, got it. Yeah. You have to bring that window forward again because I know it's very boring for everyone online to listen to me complain about tech. Sorry, but this is the end of the COVID year. We're used to this, right? Yeah, we're not on mute. That's good. All right. In 2011, I wrote a paper with Ben Weiss and Maria Zuber, who are both on this mission now, um, talking about that process of differentiation of planetesimals. So if you didn't before understand differentiation in planetesimals, I think you've got it now, right? How did those first cores form in those little early bodies? And it was part of a whole, there's a whole literature about this, like there isn't everything in science and there are like six people who care about it very deeply. And, um, and when we published this paper, it made a lot of people really upset uh, for reasons that I don't need to go into right at this moment, but I'm happy to tell you about later if you want. But it was one of those moments of high drama in science. Uh, there's this in a companion paper and we were presenting them uh, publicly after publication for the first time at the Lunar and Planetary Science Conference. And uh, I walked up to give this talk. I walked up to the podium. You can imagine I'm walking to the podium right now. And as I'm walking up, the room is filling with people. And it, got, it was standing room only. It was a room like this big and every seat was taken and there were people lining all the walls. And in the aisles, there were uh, microphones and people were lined up at the microphone to refute me before I reached the podium. Before I had even started to talk. And I thought, this is going to be fun. Um, and so I gave the talk, and it was not as upsetting as everyone thought. It was more plausible, which is always lovely, right? And we had a lot of big discussion. It was great. Lots and lots of fun. It was very high drama for science. And, um, and then I got an email from a couple of scientists at Jet Propulsion Laboratory who said, we really like your paper. Would you like to propose a mission to test your ideas? And it had literally never occurred to me to try to lead a mission proposal. Um, I'd been on different committees for you know, standing review boards and, and science definition teams and these other kinds of things that NASA sets up for missions, but I didn't even really know how it worked. But of course you get an email like that and you say, yes. <laughs> And so, and so we started putting together and right away we had five or six people and we spent about six months trying to decide where we could go in the solar system to look at these ideas. And so uh, before you know it, it's three years later and NASA has put out the call for the discovery proposals. And so and by that time uh, I had convinced Jet Propulsion Laboratory to be our NASA mission manager, um, what's now called Maxar and was then Space Systems Laurel to be our industry partner. I assembled 20 people on a science team and a whole bunch of groups to build the instruments. And we had written the kind of science we're trying to do. And with a team of about 40 people, we wrote the proposal for which this is the cover, 218 pages, step one proposal. No funding to do any of that. That's all just because you love it somehow, you find the time. So this you all now know is the artist's interpretation of the moment of impact that began to strip the rock off of Psyche. So we submitted the 218 page step one proposal. And I'll just tell you because uh, uh, maybe this is just vanity, but I feel like I look different now than I did in that video, which was made fairly shortly after this because I had just completed chemotherapy for um, ovarian cancer which I went through while we wrote this. And so that was a very interesting life event. And I definitely recommend trying to do some completely giant, audacious, impossible thing like win a NASA mission to distract you from a super annoying thing like an illness. And so I'm feeling much better now and I'm all good. And I kind of think this really helped. So, uh, so that was our step one proposal, 29 proposals went in. And, and uh, I don't know, a year later, I don't know how long it was now. Um, NASA called to say we had been down selected into step two. 
So five missions were selected to go on and do a further year of competition. In fact, all together, it was three years of competition. And so um, this is the cover of our step two proposal. Isn't it gorgeous? This is the same artist, the same guy who's done all the art you've seen so far. His name is Peter Rubin. He's a professional Hollywood artist. He designed one of the S's for Superman. He did some ghosts for Ghostbusters. And he sat on Zoom with me Saturday afternoons learning about science for a very long time. And so this is maybe 30 seconds later with the impactor screaming off down to the left and the molten rock of the core beginning to be revealed in this young planetesimal. We were trying to give the reviewers the idea of what we were imagining. So this baby was over a thousand pages long and we had 150 people and uh, some really crazy intense parts of this competition, including a full week living at our industry partner while the uh, uh, professional review board grilled us. I mean, it was just, um, it was like, it was like your PhD uh, uh, qualifying exam times a thousand done as a Hollywood super production with custom art and repainting the entire building in a banner that falls all the way to the ground from the roof and you know the executive lunchroom redesigned and there's a lot of money in these things and so it's like you know the night before the Super Bowl you're trying to win something that will keep 800 people in their jobs for a decade and so um, there's a, a lot of pressure. <laughs> It was super fun and not just because we won. It was also super fun all by itself, but it was also fun because we won. Um, so this is what we ended up with. So, uh, so Arizona State University, we're the lead. JPL is our mission manager. Maxar is our industry partner. And then we're getting science instruments from the Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory. They're doing the gamma ray and neutron spectrometer, which is a pretty obscure instrument that most people don't know what it is. Um, Mail and space science systems put together the imagers, the cameras, and Danish Technical University built our magnetometers. And so this is what our beautiful spacecraft looks like, and you saw that in the video. So uh, here's the size of the spacecraft, in case you hadn't realized, it's quite large. So when I stand in front of the chassis, I put my hand up, I can just about reach from the bottom to the top. And uh, the inside of that is mostly empty, except for giant tanks of xenon, which is our propellant. Because we get the instruments and we put them on the outside as far away from the magnetic and electrical fields of the spacecraft as we can. So you can see up on those poles, on the booms, there's the gamma ray spectrometer, which is gonna tell us what the composition of Psyche is from orbit, which is pretty cool. It's gonna tell us the elements that make up Psyche. There's the magnetometers looking for that magnetic field. Um, there's that big high gain antenna. And then um, the ion thrusters, I'm gonna show you some pictures of. And then over there on the left, it says DSOC, Deep Space Optical Com. That is a technology demonstration we're flying for NASA um, to test communicating with Earth using lasers instead of radio. And it is super cool. I'll show you a picture of that too. And so when we unfold those beautiful solar rays, it's gonna be 25 meters across. It's the size of a single tennis court. And at earth, uh, it's gonna be about 20 kilowatts uh, produced by those solar rays. Of course, it gets less as we go away from the earth. And because if you are quick with physics, earth is at one astronomical unit from the sun, Psyche is at nine. So we get about one ninth the energy, so it's like he's at three. Uh, so we get about one ninth the energy from our solar arrays when we're at Psyche than we do here. It's a one over R squared relationship. So we had to make the solar arrays so big that when we get to Psyche, we'll still get enough power to run everything, the thrusters and all the instruments and everything that we do. All right, and we're gonna launch on a SpaceX Falcon Heavy, uh, which is to me, any like rocket geeks here, do you guys love this as much as I do? Isn't it just the coolest thing ever? So let me tell you something really awesome. Wait, I'll tell it in a minute. I'm trying to tell you one other thing first. Beautiful picture, that's not us launching. Because wait, in the video it said, we're launching August, 2022. Did we launch in August, 2022? No, we did not. And that is a crisis of despair that I can barely express to you how hard that is to go through. Uh, the entire team, which is working three shifts, just killing themselves, trying to build this thing during COVID. Guess what? You cannot build a spacecraft remotely. You have to be there. JPL closed entirely for three months. Three months. Then you have to make it up. And you can only have a certain number of people in every room building everything together because of COVID. And then someone gets sick and it gets shut down again. It was really hard. We finished the spacecraft. 
we shipped the spacecraft to Kennedy Space Center, the software didn't quite get done. And we had to admit that it wasn't gonna be done in time. We had to come to that conclusion, tell NASA headquarters, we had to get them to accept that fact. And then they said, you may continue working. This was uh, in the summer, last summer. You may continue working, but we're gonna put you under internal review. So they hire this super high powered group of experts and bring them in to find out everything about why we slipped, why we weren't making it, what we still have to do, whether or not it's plausible that we could launch in a year and all the things that JPL did or didn't do right. And it was a pretty agonizing process. And um, in the end, and we had to simultaneously, we're help supporting the internal review board because they're doing their best to help us, even though it's super painful. We're continuing to finish the software and finish the build of the spacecraft. And at the same time, we have to completely reschedule and replan the entire rest of the mission. Because uh, if we launch next October, which is our next opportunity, it's a whole different trajectory to get out there. We get there many years later, we have to completely change our science ops and we have to do all that replan in six weeks, which is normally takes six months. So can I tell you, it's been a very stressful year as Sona who works with me can attest and she's been a totally steady rock through this whole thing while I regularly freaked out and said, I cannot make any more decisions today. I have reached utter decision fatigue. It's 3 p.m. Do not ask me anything else. <laughs> and, uh, and so the final report out and what's called a continuation slash termination review was last Tuesday at NASA headquarters. Friday, not even a week ago, we were announced that we're continued. And so uh, I don't know what I would have done if we'd been terminated. What would I talk to you about? I would have to just <laughs> keep the monopoly money. I don't know. So, uh, so we are going from launch, uh, the opening of our launch, uh, when launch period is October 10th of 2023. I think I said October 11th earlier, that is wrong. It's October 10th of 2023, so 11 months from now. So here's the really cool thing, if that wasn't cool enough, but here's the thing that makes me really happy because it's been very stressful and difficult. And it, I, for a while I was like a stress ninja, I was totally handling it. And then I just like flipped out and I was like, my entire professional career is ruined. And then I was like, no, snap out of it. And so uh, we got continued. And then on Tuesday, I got to go to Kennedy Space Center, actually to Cape Canaveral on the Space Force side and sit on console in mission control for the launch of the Falcon Heavy that happened on Tuesday, me and about five people on the team so we could practice for when we launch. And so let me tell you, I just utterly geeked out. We were allowed to sort through all the menus and the graphical user interface and look at all the block diagrams and watch the tanks fill. And uh, we even found the launch abort button, which was not enabled on our, on our, <laughs> on our, on our consoles. And then uh, after the launch, we I guess you can't see the launch from inside the mission control. You just see the screens that you see on television when you're watching. So, but after the launch, everyone pulled off their headsets, slammed them down on the desk and ran outside to watch the boosters land because both side boosters got re-landed for, re got landed for reuse less than a mile from where we were standing. And let me tell you, that is the biggest sonic boom. And uh, I don't know, there's almost nothing as exciting to that and then that in, in the world to me, that, that deep sound of power that just hits you in the gut. It was awesome. So I would urge you all to come to Florida in October and watch our Falcon Heavy launch because it's gonna be amazing. All right, so here's what we're doing now, now that we've totally replanned. We're gonna launch in October of 2023. And then you can see the trajectory like looping around and we loop all the way around and then we get a Mars gravity assist, just like Jim said, but a year later than, was originally planned. This trajectory takes six years. Our last one took 3.4. It just, Psyche's like in a different place. It takes a lot longer to get there. So we'll finally approach Psyche um, in August of 2029. And then we will orbit it for uh, an as yet indeterminate number of months, something between 21 and 38. We're still working out how to do our science ops. So that's our current plan. And it is, uh, it, so, I'm very tempted to say how disappointing it is for me to know that this mission that was gonna be done and we'd have all the science in five years is now gonna take 10 years. But then I remind myself, like I told somebody, a group a little bit earlier today, is there a more first world problem than my spacecraft is launching late? 
And so I do, I'm glad to say, have some perspective about whether or not this is heartbreaking. I think it's all going to be fine. It's just going to take a few more years. We just have to be patient. And then we're going to go find out what this thing is, which is amazing. Amazing that we get to do this. So the importance of teams. I'm super obsessed with teams. In fact, I think that's the thing that motivates me most in the world. This is a little part of our big team. At Peak, we had 800 people working on the project. Right now it's about, uh, I think it's about 300, 350. If you, you're not full-time people, but people who have some connection to the team who are doing something for us. And I care very much about how teams function. And I've tried really hard to have a positive team culture. And I think one reason is for better decisions. Uh, more ideas are heard, cool heads think better. I've had people tell me that to really make good decisions, you need to like stand up and shout and pound on the table. But the thing is then the people, frankly, the junior people who are boots on the ground actually soldering the wires together and who literally know what's happening get silenced by the loud people. So it's very, very important for a good functioning team for that project risk is reduced for that reason. We have this little motto on Psyche, the best news is bad news brought early. Uh, and that worked for almost every part of the team, except for a little part of the fight software team, which had a different culture and we were not aware of it and they were silenced and that's the part that didn't make it. So that's very heartbreaking for me, but also a validation of this idea. And also attraction of retention of talent because bullying and rudeness and harassment reduce diversity. So these are all reasons to keep a good team culture. So let's see that spacecraft. All right, this is a spacecraft shipping container. Uh, it is completely climate controlled and, and, and it has sensors of every possible variety and it has a ge generator um, attached and a backup generator. And it's absolutely sealed and completely clean like a clean room inside. They're very expensive items. They're about a million and a half dollars. And uh, we had to build a new one for Psyche and we're sharing with a couple of other missions. And it was coming, being shipped over from Europe. It came through the Panama Canal. We're tracking it. It's coming up the coast, gets on a truck, comes up to the Air Force Base. Then it gets on another truck to come to JPL. And then they ran it into a bridge, <laughs> which I could not believe it. It was a low bridge, known low bridge. You know, there's the flag car, there's the police car, there's the truck, there's the other truck. And they were supposed to go around the bridge and they just drove straight under it and hit it into the bridge. And so we called up the guys in, uh, in Europe and we say, we're not even going to believe it, but you need to get on a plane right now and come over and make sure it's still secure because we slammed it into a bridge. And they go, oh, that happens to like a quarter of our shipping containers. <laughs> and plus it's got on the side of it, it's got a stencil, spacecraft, do not drop. <laughs> I, could, I was like, really? Really? I love it. So anyway, all these things. So here is the spacecraft being carried. It's out of the shipping container in the clean room, giant clean room. See how big that clean room is? Um, and, it's, and it's being connected up to that connector ring there, which holds it and spins it or holds it at any angle so that it can be worked on. Um, it's a beautiful dolly that it sits on, March of 2021. Here's me in the red glasses and Henry Stone, our project manager in the clean high bay with our beautiful spacecraft behind us just when it was first delivered to Jet Propulsion Laboratory. And um, this is the team that installed the deep space optical comm, which is that thing wrapped in the silver reflective foil. So here's deep space optical comm. So instead of radio, it's laser. So they had to build a laser transmitter in an observatory in California that can send a laser all the way to the spacecraft when it's near Mars. And then the spacecraft, that little thing is actually what's called the doghouse, the instruments inside it. The instrument will detach from the spacecraft and float free inside that doghouse and use electromagnets to point back at Earth even more precisely than our spacecraft can point it. And then it'll shoot a laser back to Earth, it won't hurt anything. And it'll be detected at a different observatory in California using um, a, a 64 item array of superconducting nanowires, which means that if a single photon of that laser hits one of those nanowires, it'll hit, heat up that super cold nanowire and bring it out of a superconducting state. And the minute it comes out of the superconducting state, they know a photon hit it. And that is the deep space optical comm, which just blows my mind. I can't even believe it. Super excited about that. All right, August, 2021, our hero shot. Are we having an earthquake? What is happening? Rumbling and shaking, it must be good, whatever it is. All right. It's what? Oh, it's the dance building. We're having we're having like a stomp competition. Yeah. 
That's kind of cool. I like it. It makes it all more exciting. All right. Uh, so here's the gamma ray neutron spectrometer um, installed. And uh, by the way, they send those from Applied Physics Laboratory using FedEx. And, and, and you can see the little map of where your item is tracking across your absolutely irreplaceable multi, multi-million dollar instrument. And then you get an email, your package has been delivered. Uh, it's, you can't make it up, right? Here are those beautiful ion thrusters with their red remove before flight caps on them. And here's what they look like on the left being tested in a vacuum chamber. And so they have this incredible blue plasma, just like Star Trek. So that's kind of cool. We have to do all these tests. One of the things we have to do is test um, for electromagnetic interference between any of the systems on the spacecraft. And to do that, you have to put it into a Faraday cage, which uh, separates the spacecraft from every other electrical impulse around it. And that is a giant Faraday cage the size of a spacecraft made of carbon fiber material. So for any of you who are into this kind of thing, that's like a good geek out moment too. It's pretty cool. And then we also have to put it into vacuum at space temperatures and test that it will work in vacuum. So JPL luckily has a giant vacuum chamber made exactly for this. So here's the spacecraft being loaded into this huge vacuum chamber, the 25 uh, foot diameter. You can see the little person down there and they shut the door and they bolt it shut and they evacuate it to space vacuum. And then they've got these huge lights on the top so they can mimic being very close to the sun or being very far from the sun. And you test everything on the spacecraft. This tech just blows me away, I love it. Here's our beautiful solar array on one side unfolded. All this stuff above it is a, a special framework that supports it because it's only designed to unfold under uh, zero gravity out in space. And so in order to practice unfolding it on earth, you need to unload the force of gravity perfectly so that it would be like it's unfolding in zero gravity. So everything you do with these things is so complicated. It's ridiculous, that's the, the punchline there. So then uh, Psyche was uh, sent to Kennedy Space Center in a C-17 on our beautiful, completely repaired shipping container. And there she will stay until launch. And so I did go to visit her at uh, Kennedy while the assembly test and launch operations team was working on her and she's being um, now stored there. I was just at Kennedy obviously for this launch and I didn't get to visit because she's all, all wrapped up and stored, um, but ready to go for October. And the C-17 shipping thing is pretty amazing too, those giant, giant planes, it just fit. They actually had to take the shipping material and test it because it was designed to be such a close tolerance. They were worried that if one thing had been done wrong, it wouldn't have fit in the plane. And there is no larger shipping plane available to NASA. Um, the, apparently the uh, uh, space systems, Laurel, now Maxar, they have a big shipping container that they use for their giant comm satellites, but they fly them in an Antonov which is Antonov, you can judge from the name, not free to NASA. NASA does not fly Antonov for free. And so C-17 is what we had to fit in. So, and so we did. And so this is my last slide. That's me on the left and Brian Bone, who's our assembly test and launch operations manager under the spacecraft. We've completely degaussed ourselves and we've got our degauss bands on and we're totally uh, clean roomed up. And he's pointing out with the flashlight uh, the, uh, the um, telecom system that had just been installed that day. And uh, so that is the thrill of working on a NASA mission. You get to learn all the parts and all the parts of the team. And now we are filled with the new excitement about getting to launch in October. And I hope that you'll all follow along and um, have the adventure with us. So there's, a, there's our good ASU website up there, which includes um, our, our, our student collaboration program is, is um, NASA requires it be for college students. And there are a couple of different ones, uh, but we sort of got around that for anyone because we have free online courses that are available to anyone in the world. And one of them is about the process and evolution of a space mission, how does it happen? Second one is about creating inclusive teams um, done by a, a super expert in, uh, in team building. And then we're gonna have one about small bodies in the solar system like comets and asteroids. And another one about the debugging mindset, how you get it, your head into the attitude of looking for where the problems the unknowns are and how to fix them rather than just accepting what's in the textbook. And so those are all for free. Um, and uh, the mission and I are both on uh, various social media and we post pretty pictures and stuff if you're interested to follow. So that is the whole presentation. I'd be so happy to answer any questions that you have and thanks for coming tonight.
Are we gonna do this? Yeah. Are they on already? Yeah, they're on. Okay. Have you guys played with these before? These are throw around microphones. And so if you have a question, I don't think I can throw it all the way to you, but I can throw it to you and you can throw it to him. Ready? <laughs> Behind you. You have to throw it to him. There we go. All right. What is the evidence that uh, Psyche is metal and how is it connected to your controversial paper? Oh, great. Okay. Great. That is a really great question that sometimes people forget to ask. How do we know that it's made of metal? <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, what are the things we can measure here from Earth? The very first and most important piece of evidence is its density. And so, and so we have these lovely iron meteorites um, that uh, come to Earth from the asteroid belt, as we've discussed. And they're, and they're made of iron and nickel. And, and in their unbroken, complete state, their density is above 7,000 kilograms per, per cubic meter. And the rock of meteorites is only about 3,000 kilograms per cubic meter. And so what people have done is they've taken those shape models to, to estimate the volume of Psyche. I think we know within, I would say, 20% based on different people's estimates. And then they get its mass by looking how its orbit is very deflected in tiny ways by distant other bodies, which is kind of necromancy as far as I can tell. And so, and so if you, you divide, um, you divide the mass by the volume and you get the density. And so Psyche is um, probably the densest known asteroid. It kind of vies with Cleopatra, another one we think is metal, at about 4,000 kilograms per cubic meter. And so it has to be a mixture of rock and metal. And then, so now you know it's got a lot of metal in it because most asteroids are under 2,000. So Psyche's twice as dense as almost all the other asteroids. Um, so we know it's got a lot of metal in it. And then you can bounce radar off it. You can see its radar properties and you can look at the spectra of the light that comes off it and you can match that spectra to compositions. Uh, and then you can look at its thermal properties and people can do all these things remotely. And uh, the moment, at the moment, the consensus in the community is that Psyche's surface is mostly fine grain metal. We will find out if that is true. And so the, the um, the paper that, that I wrote in 2011 and the companion paper that Ben Weiss led, I'll just tell you a tiny bit about it. How many of you here have heard of a meteorite called Allende? A few people? It is a super famous meteorite. It's the most published about rock on earth ever. There's a big fall of meteorites that fell in Mexico in what year, 64? Who knows the number? I'm looking at you all hoping you'll correct me. It was 1964, I assert. I don't know when it was, um, but, but, uh, but it was very exciting because it's a fresh fall from space. And so it was uncontaminated by earth water and things like that. So a whole bunch of people, scientists got in their cars and just drove over the border and started buying rocks from farmers. And uh, the thing that's special about Allende is that it is pristine, unmelted, undifferentiated, and it contains those pebbles some of the early dust and gas made pebbles called calcium aluminum inclusions. And when people find the date of those calcium aluminum inclusions, what date does it give us? 4.568 billion years ago. So Allende is the poster child of primitive meteorites that give us the literal age of the very first solids of our solar system. Therefore, people say, could never have differentiated into a core because that would have wiped out the record of those early pebbles, they would have melted. But then my friend Ben Weiss found a very strong magnetic field in Allende, which we argued was a field created by a core dynamo, just like we have on Earth, on Allende's parent body. The only way you make that is with a metal core, which means that Allende's parent body was differentiated. That is heresy. Right, And so we argue that the inside of Allende had heated up enough to differentiate, but the crust on the outside, which ended up being what fell to Earth, remained, retained its primitive texture, but also inherited a magnetic field. So we don't know if we're right or wrong, but it was pretty compelling. Mainly what we were talking about was how the way that the inside of these planetesimals melted to make cores, it was not necessarily a simple thing where either the whole body melted and made a core and a mantle, or um, not at all, but it could have differentiated partially just on the inside. So that's what the paper was about. And in the end, the best we could do in terms of asteroids to visit is one that showed us any part of a core. 
So that's how we got to Psyche. I hope that wasn't too long an answer, but that was the correct answer anyway. Thanks. And now you have to throw it to the next person. Excellent, <laughs> totally successful. I have, thank you so much for sharing your story and everything. That was incredible. I have a million questions, but I'll start with two. <laughs> <laughs> so one is why are uh, magnetic fields purple? And <laughs> two is um, about the DCOS system. Like, is that the main communication system? No. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to answer question two first. Um, the the DSOC, the laser comm system, is, um, has nothing to do with the science and the primary mission. In fact, it's required that technology demonstrations be fully separable from the main mission. We will not use it for any science, and it will not be on when we're at Psyche. And if you've been following along carefully, you might be able to guess it's because it aims itself with electromagnets. And if we turn them on, we will not be able to measure the magnetic field of the asteroid. It will be swamped by the electromagnets of DSOC. So it is purely to prove that eventually we will be able to stream Netflix to Mars. And um, I'm only kind of kidding about that. Um, so your first question, why is magnetic field purple? Um, <laughs> One of the very fun things that I got to do as the lead of the mission was um, hire someone to make us uh, a mission logo. And I decided, and you've seen it on a bunch of these slides, I don't know if it's on this one, I guess not. Um, I decided I was not gonna have the spacecraft in the black of space orbiting somebody, which is like every logo of every spacecraft ever. I wanted something brighter colored and kind of more attractive and abstract. So I heard this great, young graphics designer in San Francisco. His name is Michael Taylor. And he made our beautiful patch um, through the whole process, you know, mood boards and colors and all this stuff. And we picked out the colors of Psyche, one of which is purple, which is why we have magnetic fields that are purple. And he was a very serious straight face guy. I could never get him to smile through the whole design process. And finally we got selected. And, uh, and, I, and I said, Michael, can you just hop on a Zoom? I have some news. And I said, Michael, NASA has selected us for flight and we are one step away from getting your logo painted on the side of a giant rocket to space. And he goes, cool. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, that's all I'm ever gonna have. It's never gonna get better than that. <laughs> but then it got better because, uh, you know, fast forward five years and I'm putting together the launch invitation list and I wanted to invite him. And he said, can I bring my girlfriend? And I said, absolutely. Turns out his girlfriend is the niece of one of our science team members. And we didn't even know that. Um, so that was kind of cool. Anyway, that's why magnetic fields are purple. Yeah. <laughs> that worked. That was close enough. Um, you talk about having to call the mission because of the software. How far in advance do you have to make that call? Uh, I wouldn't say there's a have to. You know, you can cancel the launch right up to about 10 seconds before launch. And so uh, it is remarkably difficult to know whether or not you can do a certain set of tasks by a certain time. And so figuring out with the whole team, what's our margin? How, much, how many spare days in our supposed schedule do we have? And, can we add more people or is there no one else trained who can really join? Can we parallelize? What if you guys are willing to work long hours? You know, you have to go through all of those things and you have to really, really sit down and talk to people. And what happened to us in the end was one person who was a super expert in writing the guidance navigation and control software, which is the part we had trouble with, um, joined the team. We needed extra help to figure out where we were, people who'd really done it before. She joined the team, did this big analysis and then uh, came and told us, told the program manager, project manager, I wasn't at JPL that week, that there was no way we we're gonna make it to launch. And Henry, who's the project manager, when we'd had bad things happen on the project, uh, he would text me and say, and say, uh, Lindy, can we hop on a call? And then I always knew something bad had happened because he never just like called me to tell me his dog was cute or whatever. It was always something terrible. And, um, and one time he called me and said, are you sitting down? And then I knew it was really bad. And that was a hilarious and horrible time. And then, and then this time he said, I've set up a WebEx for us tonight at 7 p.m. on Friday, and we'll talk about it then. And then I knew it was really bad. And so uh, that's what happened. Yeah, it was months ahead, but we knew. Um, so you, you were talking about all of the 
the pre-work that goes into these to like just set up the, the um, proposal. Um, mm -hmm. How do you, like, are people being paid for that? I mean, you said you weren't being paid. Like, how do you get, you know, industry involved and how does JPL involved? Happen? Like, yeah, yeah, how does it happen before it even gets officially funded by NASA? Well, we gullible scientists just add work uh, without yeah. being extra paid when you're trying to do things like that. But of course, <laughs> people working in industry, they don't work for free, do they? Exactly. So then their organizations have to put in the money. They have to decide they're going to do this. And so Jet Propulsion Laboratory, for example, can only support so many proposals going into a certain call and say they have 10 concepts that people have brought to them, but they only have enough money to support three proposals, then they have to select those for their portfolio. So that's part of the reason why I felt so much pressure at the site visit of step two, because Jet Propulsion Laboratory and Maxar and many of our other partners had invested literally millions of dollars to get us to that competition. And I felt so responsible for them. Uh, you know, I knew everybody, there was no, nobody was mistaken about what we were doing and that our chances of success were low. Um, but it just means there's a lot of pressure. More questions? Yeah. I got one. Um, so the instrumentation on the, on the, the flight vehicle. Um, the is it the spectrometer that's going to be measuring the um, composition? Yeah. Is is that just measuring the surface, or does or do you, can you get into the interior of it? It's or just a changes? little bit down. It's just it's just a, a a small distance down. This is pretty great technology. Um, there are these things uh, called intergalactic cosmic rays that maybe you've heard of these super high energy things that zip through the whole universe all the time. And if uh, they're mostly, she we're mostly shielded from them by our atmosphere, but Psyche doesn't have an atmosphere. So these high energy particles slam into the airless surface of Psyche and the moon and every other airless surface. And they hit an atom and that atom is then excited by the energy of the cosmic ray. And when it goes out of its excitement state, it releases a gamma ray and a neutron. And so our orbiting spacecraft collects those gamma rays in um, a giant green germanium crystal that is a scintillator to gamma rays. It's the most pure material made by humans. And it's like this big. It's, it's like, it looks like Krypton for Superman, but it's germanium, so don't be confused. And so the gamma ray hits it and it gets measured. And the energy of the gamma ray tells us which atom had released that gamma ray. And then we get a whole range of neutrons that helps us um, differentiate silicates from metals. I think they're just amazing, amazing instruments. Applied Physics Laboratory. Um, so I realize this is probably a bit of a loaded question. I know <laughs> collisions are super hard to constrain, but are there any tell like telltale signs that you're looking at to, or I guess any possible constraints you can put on the impact that um you know created psyche um yeah so so if our idea that psyche was a differentiated planetesimal that had its rock knocked off by impacts um uh eric asfog at university of arizona is one of the world's experts on impacts and his models say it would take four to eleven impacts to knock off enough rock that it would look like psyche and when he runs um simulations of the formation of the solar system Many times they have no psyches in them. Every once in a while they have one psyche and very occasionally he gets two psyches. So plausible, low pro probability, similar to the fact that we have one psyche. So we're pretty happy with that. Um, one thing that, um, that supports the giant collision idea is that psyche's spin axis, so here's the plane, the ecliptic plane that all of our planets um, orbit in and, and most of the planets spin axes like the earth are more or less vertical psyches is, in the plane of the ecliptic. So it's rotating like a rotisserie chicken. So something hit it hard, whether it was the event that stripped off the rock. Yeah. Thank you. Anybody else? We've got back here. It'll take two oh, throws, gosh. I bet. Yeah, Unless no you're way I'm getting Go it. for it, go for it. <laughs> no way. You can do it. OK. Oh. Yes, good job. Okay. Excellent. Um, so I have two questions. So will the... Um, the uh, sorry will psyche be out there um forever and it won't come back and if so when you collect the data that you need is there any other ways that you could possibly collect collect more data um or like i guess like update the program so we can collect more data that's a great question yes uh so our plan it turns out that contrary to star wars asteroid fields are not 
jam packed with asteroids. They're really <laughs> far apart. And there are not other asteroids that would be easiest to, for us to visit from Psyche. And so our plan is just to orbit Psyche. And then if we get what's called an extended mission, which is just what you're asking about, we'll just get closer and closer and get more and more high resolution data and eventually we'll crash on the surface. And so our many, many, we've had over 1500 undergraduate students work with us in different ways. And a lot of them are art interns, actually. And they get very, feel very personally about this spacecraft and they're sad it's not coming back. And so uh, one of them wrote a children's book about how that's actually what the spacecraft wants best, is to stay with the asteroid. <laughs> I can ask a question up here. Sure, and then That's you can go here. second. Yep. No, go ahead. Don't try. Um, yeah. So I, I really appreciate your um, attitude of hoping that you're totally wrong. Yeah. You, you said that. Like That's you, the you know, best. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I, I agree. But so it seems like uh, a core part of this hypothesis is detecting some kind of remnant magnetism on this thing, right? So That'd it's be like, great. so so that would be kind of the smoking gun if for like a core. Enough, if it's strong enough, if it's strong enough, if it's weak, it still could still be a nebular field for those aficionados here. But yes, so, we'd like it to be very strong, and then we'd know right away it was core. So say that you get out there and there's no magnetism at all, or yeah. it is something that you know. So it's like, what's what are the alternative? Um, outcomes, if, if you were to be totally wrong, what would that look like and what would it mean? Well, I mean, it's hard. <laughs> it's kind of like saying, what would life that's not like Earth life be like? No idea. Let's find yeah. out. No idea. Um, uh, but we have, um, and in fact, we, some of this is published in a paper that I published, I think, last year. I'm first author, and it's about how we're going to figure out using our instruments what Psyche is. And we have kind of a matrix of possible things we can detect and what would they mean for the kinds of models of object it could be, differentiated, undifferentiated, material fell back during differentiation and impact, chondritic, if that means anything to you, material from impactors, um, uh, uh, primordial unmelted super reduced material is another option. And so, uh, you know, keep thinking, look at that table in that paper and tell me other things you can think of and publish them because then we'll find out if you're right or wrong. It's very cool to make a wild hypothesis and then be proven right by a spacecraft. So go for it. Yeah. Um, so has NASA found any sort of asteroid that's similar to Psyche in the fact that it's um, metal? And if they have, are they interested in looking into it or do they think that it's exactly like Psyche? Yeah, there, you know, nobody knows really. And uh, this is one of the things that I loved learning, which I didn't really learn until graduate school. The number of things we don't know outnumbers the things that we know by many orders of magnitude. <laughs> and so, and so uh, there's a class of asteroids judged by their spectral features, that is the, the, um, the shape of the light curve that bounces off them. Um, and the shape of the light curve is determined by their composition. So there's a class of asteroids called M class and M stands for metal because people think they're made of metal. But the characteristic of their light curve is that it has no features. It's pretty flat and a little bit sloped. Is it only metal that has a pretty flat, a little bit sloped? No, it's not. Could be carbon, there's other stuff. But, but there are about nine of those M class that people think are metal either because of their density or because of other things like Psyche with radar and stuff like that. But we don't know for sure. Um, the other big one that we think is made of, of metal is called Cleopatra with a K and it's shaped like a dumbbell. And so uh, for those of you who are into fluid dynamics, if you see something shaped like a dumbbell, you immediately think it was fluid and flipping and freezing at the same time. Like you can picture, right? You can picture something fluid kind of getting pulled out as it flips through the air and freezes, only it wasn't flipping through the air, it was in space. And so maybe Cleopatra is part of a splash off of a metal core, but it wouldn't have that many primary features anymore because it got all melted and stretched out. So Psyche is the best option to go learn about these things. And there's lots of people who want to go to all these crazy asteroids that seem to be different than other ones. And so basically you should propose that mission. <laughs> Yeah. Right next to you there, yeah. So um, during the trip to uh, Psyche, is there like anything that you are doing with the spacecraft like during 
the time it's traveling. Yeah, yeah. We're, we're testing the instruments, checking them out, um, doing little calibrations. We're practicing our operational sequences from when we get to the mission. When we fly past Mars, we'll look at Mars. Um, we'll take pictures of star fields. The first pictures that we take are going to be super boring. We'll post them anyway. They'll just be star fields. Look, this space, you know. <laughs> um, but there's not much more than that. It's going to be mostly calibration and prep and test. Yeah, it is a long time to be doing calibration and prep and test. Also, because this is not chemical propulsion, this is solar electric propulsion, unlike chemical propulsion for you aficionados, we'll be thrusting almost all the time. We don't just thrust and then stop like another kind of rocket might do. So we actually have to have people on console maintaining it all the time and comms every week and checking the location. So there's lots of taking care of it. There's a, a question up here, a couple of questions up here. So you're gonna have to throw your thing way over there. Ready, go. Excellent. Okay, so I actually have two questions. So the first one is, do you think the research done on Psyche will help scientists understand more about the universe mm -hmm. as we know it? I sure hope so. I mean, I think it's not worth doing if that's not true. Although, you know, actually my, my uh, secret idea about space is that it inspires us all to do more here on earth. But besides that, NASA requires that I say, this is about fundamental science. And, uh, and, and I actually do really believe that, it, that it's gonna help us to understand how rocky planets are formed. And there's lots of people here who study exoplanets. We're very interested in rocky exoplanets as places to look for life. And this will just be an important part of the story of how rocky planets are formed. So that's, that's my honest answer there, yeah. Okay, and my second question was, how was Psyche exactly found? Was NASA like looking for it or did they like just come across it by yeah, accident? Great question. Okay, all right, that is so close to asking me how asteroids were discovered that I'm gonna tell you that story, which I, <laughs> which I, threatened, which I threatened to tell you before. <laughs> so so, uh, so in the, in the um, early 1800s, there was a guy named Bode who created a, an equation that um, the zeros of the equation where it crossed over the x-axis predicted the locations of the planets in their distance away from the sun pretty darn well. Now, anybody who's taken enough math knows you can write a polynomial that does that for any zero crossings you want. And so it means nothing. But people thought it was super exciting because it predicted the locations of all the planets plus it predicted one where the asteroid belt is. And so that caused a bunch of astronomers in Europe to get very excited. And a guy in Germany, an astronomer named Franz Xavier von Zach, uh, formed a group of astronomers to find the missing planet. And uh, they had a proper name, which I actually can't recall, because their common name was Die Himmelspolizei. They were the celestial police. That's how it gets, uh, it gets translated, because they were going to set order to the solar system. They were gonna set it right. They were gonna find the missing thing. They were gonna put it in the right place. So de Himmel's Polizei set about looking for this planet that was missing. And uh, first they found Ceres, the biggest asteroid, uh, and they started numbering the one Ceres and they named it Ceres. They're all named after goddesses. And then they found number two and they found number three. And finally in 1852, they found the 16th asteroid, which they named Psyche. And this was actually not made found by a member of the Himmel's Polizei. It was uh, found by um, a man named Annabale de Gasparis at the Naples Observatory. And he named it Psyche because it was just cool to name things after goddesses and gods. And it was number 16. He had no idea it was made of metal or that there was anything else special about it. But it's very fun because now we're friends with the people who work at the Naples Observatory and they are um, coming to launch and they've showed us all the uh, discovery papers and how he he wrote to famous people like Alexander von Humboldt and asked von Humboldt if he wanted the honor of naming the asteroid and Humboldt declined because he was very magisterial in those days and uh, so that's the story of finding Psyche and people did not know that it was likely made of metal until just a couple of decades ago that's all new science new science so I think everyone should have t-shirts that say die Himmels Polizei because I just think it's such a cool idea. So paper was controversial. Why was it controversial? 
I know it's hard to understand unless you're one of those six people. It's because, <laughs> in which case it enrages you. Um, it's because people thought that Allende, that meteorite with the calcium aluminum inclusions, 4.568 billion years, um, uh, they thought that it had to come from a body that was absolutely pristine because it had to come from a body that had never differentiated, never melted, could not have had a core, had no magnetic field, was the pristine original material from the solar system. So suggesting that its parent body actually was differentiated and had a magnetic field, I know this may not be justification enough, but that is why people were mad. It ruined their ideas and their lifelong work on what the parent body of Allende was. Yeah, people protect their work sometimes. It's better to really hope you're wrong. Anybody else? Oh, there we go. Ooh, big one. Okay, where's it going? Not bad. So once re uh, spacecraft reaches the psyche, uh, what do the operations look like back home here on a daily basis? Uh, we will operate out of mission control at Jet Propulsion Laboratory. And uh, it will be a series of commands that um, check on each instrument because all the instruments will be on all the time taking data except for the gamma ray spectrometer, which will only go on when it's at its lowest orbit. And then we'll be constantly checking with the deep space network exactly where the spacecraft is and fixing all the ephemera of the spacecraft so that we can uh, make sure that we're thrusting at exactly the right angle to keep it in its nice stable orbit if it needs an update. And then uh, right now our plan, like it said in the video, was to start at a distant orbit and then step down to closer orbits. And the reason we have to do that is because Psyche is shaped like a potato and it's probably made out of materials of very different density, the rock and the metal. And so in order to find a stable orbit that's closer to the body, we have to know the gravity field extremely well. And so um, we think we're gonna be able to get the gravity field up to degree in order 10 more or less, but we have to improve the gravity field at a given um, uh, orbit each time before we can step down to a new orbit. And we do that with Doppler radio effect between the deep space network antennas and the spacecraft. So those are the things we'll be doing all the time. It's like a 24 by seven operations or uh, back here? I'm trying to think if I know exactly what our likely operations schedule is. Um, no, I, I don't know exactly what our, I think, uh, I don't know exactly what our deep space network comms schedule is going to be with Psyche when it's there. That actually takes a big negotiation. That's not a guaranteed thing. I don't know if you know this, but most spacecraft don't get all their data back because we literally don't have enough bandwidth on the deep space network. It's a huge thing. Um, but we will have people every day working on the command structures and things like that. Thank you. Um, oh, there we go. Thanks. Um, if the spacecraft doesn't eventually crash into Psyche, what will happen to it? There's really no option but that, because by the time we get down to our lowest orbit, um, we will not have enough power to push the spacecraft away from Psyche. Uh, and so um, there's really no other possible outcome for it than eventually to crash into the surface. And um, really our goal is to go down so slowly that we keep our comms active for absolutely as long as possible, but we're not allowed to use the word land because land to Congress means you continue to communicate with Earth after you're on the surface. So it will be a crash landing, but hopefully a very gentle one. Yeah. Hi, um, so like in what, what can like exploring Psyche teach us about like our own core on Earth and how it was formed? Right, so, um, a really interesting thing to me, maybe not to you, we'll find out, is that, is that up until fairly recently, and maybe some of you were taught this, people thought Earth's core formed through what was called the iron catastrophe. So Earth accreted out of rock and metal, and then when some amount of heat and mass was achieved, all the metal melted and ran to the center of the planet releasing a vast amount of potential energy, heating up everything. There was this giant core formation of event. Now we know that's not true. That cores formed and merged in many stages leading up to our earth. And so Psyche is gonna show us what the very first cores look like, basically the feeding material that made our earth's core. 
And so um, there's some important questions about how our dynamo works on Earth that have to do with what is in the core besides iron and nickel? What are the light elements? Is there oxygen in there? Is there potassium? Is it sulfur? What is it? So we'll see at Psyche what the light elements are for the very first cores that formed at low pressure. And then we'll be able to compare to our models of Earth's core now. And I hope that we'll find a whopping big electric uh, magnetic field there, which will um, confirm theories of how core dynamos work. So those are some of the things. Um, behind you, nice big throw. Awesome. Uh, okay. Uh, so it's been a long, long process, I'm sure. What are some of the things you're gonna take away going to like possible future next missions, both from the results you may get and just the actual process of getting to launch? Yeah, there's so many lessons learned. And um, I do think one of the most important things is to make sure there are very strong vertical communications and horizontal communications through the team. And um, I, one thing that I learned, which is maybe obvious, but wasn't obvious to me before, is that if a part of your team is very quiet, that's not good news, that's bad news. And so what it meant in this case was not that they were laboring away healthily, but that they thought they couldn't do it and no one was letting them talk about it. And so there's some big lessons for how teams are managed. Um, it's unusual to have mission teams that are managed the way we're managing this one, where we're trying to get everybody to talk. You know how you go into a meeting and there's a conference table and the people who think that they should be heard sit at the table and the people who aren't sure they should be heard sit at the wall, chairs along the wall. So just trying to change that, trying to make it so that anybody could sit at the table and that everyone's expected to talk. I think that's really, really important. And I think that this mission, the fact that we failed proves that even more than ever. Another thing that we learned is that um, on these quote, smaller missions, you can only expect a certain number of new developments, new, um, what's the right word? Uh, um, I can't think of the word I'm trying to think of, but uh, uh, newly made aspects to work. You can't get the team to do 10 new technology miracles. So for us, um, Deep Space Optical Com caused us to redesign a lot. It was a big burden on the mission. It was a big ask. Then we also had to completely rewrite the state, the flight software for other reasons. That was another big ask. And there were some other things that were changed. But on a mission this size, you just can't change that many things or do that many developments from scratch. And so really putting your foot down, in my case, putting my foot down as PI and saying that is unreasonable, we cannot do that, is an important lesson. Um, and, uh, and it's hard because I have all these people going, we'll do it, we can do it, we should do it, you can't say no. But the truth is that in the end, I could have said no if I had known that it was unreasonable. I could have gone over everyone's head to NASA and said, NASA, we have to say no. And now in retrospect, I realize I should have done that. We had one development too many. So that was an important lesson. Um, I think another really important lesson, which is a shocker, is that it's very hard to build spacecraft during COVID. Uh, <laughs> and then finally, something that I think is really transferable to everybody's project. Um, Every part of the project that you are not personally a super expert in, you need to find someone who is a super expert to review that part of the project. Now, don't get me wrong, NASA has a million reviews. <laughs> Everything gets reviewed by different review boards, but even the people on that review board, there aren't enough people on the review board to be the super expert in every aspect of the mission. So you need to go out of your way to ask, this part of the mission, I don't think we had reviews sufficiently, our guidance and navigation and control software. We need that person, of which there's only three of them, to come and really look it over and let us know if this is realistic. And so um, not just an okay expert or somebody who has worked on that before, but someone who really has led the development of the whole thing, whatever the thing is, you need that expert to come talk to you. So, I, you know, the end, the lesson really is something we were talking about last night, which is that every endeavor is a human endeavor and that, and that humans make every miracle and every tragedy. And that, and that knowledge is very personal and difficult to transfer one person to another. Writing a manual is not the same as knowing, reading it, you know, it's not the same as knowing how to do it. So you need that person who authentically is the world's expert on that thing to come look at it. I think that's the biggest lesson. Question here? Can I just shout? Um, you can shout and I will repeat for people online. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, you mentioned a number of things that you know, to 
Do tell. Yeah, this is so interesting. And, and it's kind of exciting to be asked this question. He asks me, he says, you've mentioned a number of things that seem counter to NASA's typical culture. Are you getting any attention? Is there any shift? So one of my ideas, which seemed bizarrely to be radical, um, I was told many times that it was radical. So I'm not just saying this out of ego, but my weird idea was the following. Every one of us is trying to reach the same goal. Everybody at NASA headquarters wants us to succeed and get to Psyche. Everybody and every one of the partners wants us to succeed and get to Psyche. So let's practice radical transparency. Never try to make the apple look shinier than it is. Every single review, I asked everyone on the team over and over again, quickly show what we've done and how it's gone, the things that we think are fine. And then move on to the places where we have challenges. Explain what we've done and how we would like help. And that was really radical. And, um, and weirdly, because doesn't that seem kind of natural? Like, isn't that what you would do is ask for help when you're having, I don't know. Anyway, people are worried. They want their work to look good. It's scary to say you can't do a thing or that you're having trouble. So we really worked on that culture. And then we got some amazing support. You know, We got some people high up in leadership saying, I've been watching this mission do this and I'm gonna try to do this in future. And then we also, for a number of years, uh, were one of the more popular teams at JPL to work for because people felt that they had a chance to come and be heard and be valued in a way that they wouldn't necessarily in some of the more kind of tough-minded militaristic style teams. Um, and in fact, uh, when I was in grad school and a junior faculty, I used to discuss things like uh, lab culture um, and I, I'm sure we're all very, very familiar with the situation in science where the scientist makes a presentation like I've done and then people stand up and ask questions, which are really like attacks or refutations or accusations of not citing someone else's work, you know, not really bringing the conversation forward. And so I would talk about this kind of thing and about how um, civil discourse is a very positive way to train people and to bring us into a more fruitful future where we're solving important things that are external to people's individual fame and charisma. And sometimes people would tell me, if you can't take the show no blood in the water kind of culture, it means you're too weak to be in science. You know, you've got to be tough. And I agree, you've got to be tough no matter what you're trying to do in your, in your world. But I also think that you can be kind and, and you can be civil. And, uh, and so now it turns out that one of the reasons we were selected is because the headquarters review team could see that our team was respectful of each other. So I would get a question from the review board. I'm a top expert in like 5% of this mission, right? The rest of it is all other people's expertise. And I would pass it to the person who knows best. And maybe I pick the wrong person, they pass it to the other person. But the point is we're turning the question of the person who really knows best and listening respectfully. And that's one of the reasons we were selected. So now I can stand up and say, a good culture in your team is worth a billion dollars. And that <laughs> gives me a lot more strength in what I'm saying. Yeah. Well, tonight's talk was simply out of this world. Tomorrow's talk is a little more down to earth. Um, it's volcanoes and the great dying, the end of the Permian extinction. Um, that talk will actually take place tomorrow at 1.45 p.m. in Jennings Hall. Um, and, and you're welcome to join us in Jennings Hall tomorrow again at 1.45 for, for a different, much more technical talk. Uh, on behalf of the School of Earth Sciences, I would like to thank all of you for coming out. And if you could join me one last time and recognizing and acknowledging our 78th uh, Boniker medalist, Professor Lindy Elkins Tanton. Thank you. Thanks for everybody for coming. And just so you know, if you're interested in the end Permian extinction, uh, it's, it's gonna be uh, technical, but totally comprehensible and will include field photos from Siberia. So if you wanna to come tomorrow. Thanks very much for your time tonight.